Last week, we kicked off a series called Citizens. Look at your neighbor and say Citizens. And in this series, we've been establishing the fact that we have a dual citizenship, that we are uh, in the world, but not of the world. And where do we get that statement? From John chapter 17, from something Jesus said about his disciples, that they are in the world, but not of the world, that his kingdom is not of this world. And so you and I have this dual citizenship, that we are citizens of this wonderful, remarkable nation, and we are citizens of the kingdom of God. And in this series, we have been uh, just leaning into the tension that I think every single one of us can relate to and every single one of us has experienced when it comes to uh, our faith and our politics. How do we engage in society and how do we add value and participate in public life while simultaneously glorifying God and living a life for Jesus Christ? And a good handle for all of us to keep in mind and keep in front of us is the difference between a biblical worldview and a political worldview. A biblical worldview views your politics through the filter of your faith. And a political worldview views your faith through the filter of your politics. And there come points for every single one of us, I don't think we really graduate from this, where there uh, at times can be a tension and the question is, is which is going to inform the other? And we said last week that any time we as followers of Christ choose Caesar over Christ, it's a miss. And I thought, well, man, this is, this is gonna be a tough message. Maybe this is gonna be a hard adjustment. Maybe this will be difficult for some to embrace. And then came the first debate. I thought this might be an easier sell than I thought. <laughs> and relax, you can smile and have fun in church. I don't know about you, but I use humor as a coping mechanism. Um, but, but here's the deal. I, I do think as a community of faith, uh, we can be people of class. And I do think we can be people of sound mind who look at the situation for what it is. One of these two gentlemen is going to be charged with the incredible responsibility to lead our nation and to have a big impact, not only for our country, but around the world. And as the people of God, at a bare minimum, uh, we should be covering both of them in prayer because we need whoever it is uh, to do well and to do right uh, by the American people and the world we have influence over. And, and I think we can operate in class. And, and just know, we, we said this last week, we'll say it again, our church exists and will forever exist only to promote one person, and his name is Jesus Christ, who is the King of Kings and is the Lord of Lords, amen? No one wants to show up to a church that uh, produces or promotes anything else. It's like when you turn on ESPN and they're showcasing a spelling bee or poker. It's like ESPN is for sports, not for playing cards and not for spelling words, it's for sports. And the church is for the gospel of Jesus Christ, the word of truth and aligning our lives to God's will and his word, amen. And I love scripture. It is so um, insightful. It is breathtaking at times. It just comes close to home and illuminates things within our lives that uh, maybe we don't consider. And it positions us to live a life for Christ that in many ways seems beyond our comprehension, where God extends to us influence and opportunities for impact. And it's our moment as a, a generation and as a community of faith where we now get the part to play in God's next chapter in his redemptive plan in and through the world. Like we have this moment in time entrusted to us to either add value or add to the situation in terms of negative ways. And it makes me think of statistics. I love some of the data that now is produced through sports, uh, specifically basketball. One of my favorite statistics is what is called the plus minus stat. What this does is when you enter the game, essentially you start out at a zero. And say you enter the game and your team is down two, you play for six minutes and you exit the game and now your team is up two. Well, what is your plus minus? You're a plus four. And then you exit the game, they capture that for you. And throughout the remainder of the game, every time you enter, they are capturing and tracking, does this individual uh, add value or do they hurt the team? And history will in many ways capture a plus or minus 
on the people of God and the community of faith in this moment in history. I think we stand positioned with an incredible opportunity in front of us as people of God, disciples of Christ, uh, to have a tremendous impact in the world. And my prayer, my desire, my longing is that we as children of God would rise up in faith in a moment such as this, all to add value, to champion Christ, to preach the gospel, and to bring about the good news to a world that desperately needs some good news. Can I get an amen? And that is what's before us. Now, if you have your Bibles, we're gonna hang out in Matthew chapter five, but if you peel it back to Matthew chapter three, you have what is one of my favorite situations or moments in the entire Bible. You have the baptism of Jesus. Jesus comes up out of the waters of baptism, and what happens? It says the Holy Spirit descends upon him like a dove, and God the Father speaks a blessing over him. This is my son with whom I am well pleased. It's amazing, you have the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in the same scene, and it's beautiful, it's wonderful. And coming out of the waters of baptism, what does Jesus do? He immediately heads into the wilderness to fast for 40 days, all before he is about to initiate and inaugurate his ministry and the kingdom of God. And as he heads into the wilderness to fast, who meets him there? The devil. And the devil begins to tempt Christ. And I think this is going to be a reality for every single one of us. Where the Lord leads you, the enemy will meet you. That there will always be a predictable resistance as we follow Christ. The old saints would refer to this as spiritual warfare. That the birthmark of a Christian is a target. And the more you follow Christ, it seems to enlarge in upon your back. And so Jesus is about to begin his ministry, but he's also about to end his fast. And this is when the devil shows up and begins to tempt him. And there's a lot of insight there when it comes to spiritual warfare, that a lot of times the devil's temptation shows up, one, when we're just getting started, or two, when we're getting close. A lot of times it's when we're stepping into a new endeavor, it's when we're stepping out in faith and some act of obedience that we step in the direction of God's plan and his purpose for our life and we're immediately met with predictable resistance. And why is that? The devil knows God's ability to work in the lives of humans. And so he is intentional to trip us up in the momentum that we could develop early on in our journey. But simultaneously, the devil tempts him right when he's about to complete his fast. And a lot of times, spiritual warfare reaches an all-time high when you are near a breakthrough, when you're getting close to God's desired outcome in your life or plan or promises that he has before you. And Satan would so love for you and I to break down rather than break through. And so it's just learning to anticipate the nature of this as we live this life, that yes, we can be focused on the material and yes, we can be focused on the natural, but everything is spiritual. There is a spiritual component at work at all times. And the moment we ignore this, we develop a pretty massive blind spot that makes us susceptible. Now, what is comical to me is how boring and predictable Satan's strategy is. Satan shows up in the wilderness and he begins to tempt Jesus the same way he tempted who? Adam and Eve in the garden. And what we established last week was the garden kingdom from day one in perfection and in God's wonderful creation was this element, this theme, this emphasis on royalty and nobility and ruling and reigning. And God's initial de uh, uh, desire was for the garden kingdom to become a global kingdom. Yet Satan shows up and he gets Adam and Eve to doubt God's word, doubt their identity, and they crack the door for chaos to enter the world. And so Jesus shows up and he heads out into the wilderness for a similar type of showdown with the devil. And where Adam fell to temptation, Jesus triumphs over the temptation. This is where if you get into the writings of Paul, Paul will at times refer to Jesus as the second Adam, that he showed up accomplishing what the first Adam failed to do. 
And what you discover is where the garden kingdom was supposed to be a global kingdom, Jesus came inaugurating and initiating that very movement to eventually, not only would he inaugurate it, but we discovered last week that now he sits crowned upon the throne of God and we live between coronation and consummation when it comes to the kingdom of God. And it is in that that we discover that this kingdom is on the move that Jesus's ministry jumped outside of Galilee. It jumped outside the Roman Empire. In fact, it jumped off the continent and over oceans to where now the gospel and the local church and the word of God is declared on every continent around the world because this kingdom is spreading. It is a global kingdom. And at some point, Christ returns for his bride and he brings into full completion his perfect and pleasing will for humanity, earth, and heaven. It's wonderful. And so you and I live in what the theologians would refer to as the already but not yet time of history. That the kingdom has already been established, but it has not yet been brought to full completion. And for whatever reason, God knew that you and I would be alive at this time in history, and that he, in some way that is mind-boggling, believes you and I can get the job done and carry forward his redemptive plan in the world. I mean, that's a stack hands, oorah kind of moment. Like, okay, God, if you believe in us, may we embrace that type of confidence. And so Jesus comes out of the wilderness And he begins to preach. And what was his message? Matthew chapter four, pretty simple. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Repent for the kingdom, it's here. Now here's the thing that a lot of people miss when it comes to Christ and his teachings. If you do not understand how Jesus teaches, you won't understand what Jesus is teaching. If you don't understand how he teaches, you might not understand what he teaches. And Jesus comes and everything he does in many ways is a great reversal. That the kingdom of God from day one and moving forward is upside down and it's inside out. And a lot of Jesus' teachings have to do with the paradigms that we have built our life upon and the concepts and the constructs that we live with. And what Jesus is saying very gently at times is the things you anchor your life to, these concepts, these paradigms, these theories, these philosophies, well, they don't carry water over time. In fact, it's, it's actually upside down the way you're looking at it. And that's what is implied in the word repent, that this word is misused and misinterpreted often that a lot of people have triggers and certain people come to mind when they hear the word repent. But what does the word repent mean? Change your mind. Therefore, you can change your ways. It's a pretty simple term. Jesus is saying, hey, I've come that you might change your mind in a way that would result in changing your ways. The apostle Paul would put it in this way. He would say, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed. And how? By the renewing of your mind. That repentance is a beautiful invitation for you and I to see things in a new way, also that we can begin living in a new way. Jesus says, repent. Think of it differently. You have it wrong. You have it backwards. And Jesus in Matthew chapter five launches into what is famously known as the Sermon on the Mount. It's a wonderful sermon. In fact, it is the greatest sermon ever preached by the greatest preacher who had ever lived. And Jesus goes on for chapters and chapters, and he runs the gauntlet talking about every type of topic and taboo situation. Anyone love a long-winded preacher? I sometimes wonder if this is why he only had 12 following him. He preached too long. And Jesus is remarkable. Now, the Sermon on the Mount, that is not what Jesus entitled his message. That's what Bible interpreters entitled the message. I personally think it's a bad title. One commentary said that it would be better uh, titled as the Sermon of the Monarch, not the Sermon on the Mount. 
The Sermon on the Mount doesn't tell us anything. It doesn't give us any insight or clues as to what should we expect from this message. It would be like me saying, today's sermon is titled, The Sermon from the Stage. Like, well, what does that mean? But this is the sermon of the monarch that Jesus showed up you know, preaching kingdom virtues and kingdom values. This is how my people will operate in the world. And he's King Jesus. And I think a lot of people treat God the same way I treat tomatoes. I love everything a tomato makes. I love me some ketchup. I love me some salsa, but I cannot bite into a tomato. Anyone else you're like me? It's like, I love what they make. I just don't like the tomato itself. And I think the same is true when it comes to God. I love that he can provide peace and I love that he extends grace and I love that he can impart joy and I love that he can shape my identity, but I just don't know if I wanna fully embrace God and surrender my life completely to God. And just know at some point you will bow your knee to Christ. At some point you and I will all yield to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You might as well do it now and join Christ in his redemptive work in the world. It's, it's wonderful uh, that we have this opportunity. And Jesus, he launches into this sermon of the monarch. As the king, here's how we're gonna operate. Here's how we're gonna function. And it's going to look very different than you assume. Here, here's a great question to create attention as we jump into this. Who killed Jesus? Now, some, a popular answer will say, well, the Jews killed Jesus. But that's kind of misleading. Yes, Jewish people were part of killing Jesus, but Jewish people were also a part of his family. They were his friends. They were his disciples. So when you say the Jews killed Jesus, it's misleading. Does that make sense? So what is a more specific, clarifying, and accurate answer to who killed Jesus? The religious people. Jesus showed up inaugurating the kingdom of God, preaching kingdom virtues and values and saying, this is what God the Father is like. If you know me, you know him. And the religious people started losing their mind because Jesus in many ways was flipping upside down how they were thinking of things. And Jesus begins in many ways to create a distinction between the gospel and the religion that they had grown accustomed to. And so here's how his sermon begins. He says, now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up onto a mountainside and sat down. And his disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me? Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, this is gonna be challenging because this portion of Jesus' sermon is known as what? The Beatitudes. This is a frame of mind, a way of thinking, a paradigm shift that we all need to embrace. And this is the introduction to the most famous sermon. And quite honestly, I don't think one sermon can do the Beatitudes justice. To do it you know, accurately and well, I think you would have to do one Beatitude each week and do an entire sermon around each one. But today we're just gonna take a bird's eye view of this idea. Jesus starts out his message and he is redundant and repetitive. Blessed, 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 blessed. And it's, it's very clear that from the very start of this ministry and this kingdom that he is bringing into play, that it comes with God's unmerited favor, 
God's goodness, God's grace, God's joy, God's fulfillment, God's satisfaction within our lives. That's what it means to be blessed. That some translations, chances are you have a Bible and, and your version says, happy are the poor in spirit and happy are the peacemakers. And the challenge with that translation is not to say that blessedness doesn't contain happiness, but happiness doesn't contain blessedness. The same way a few months ago, I, I was teaching on God's love and where scripture says God is love, I pointed out that yes, God is love, but you can't reverse it. Love is not God. You start worshiping love, you go sideways pretty quickly. Love uh, is not God, but God is love. Well, in the same way, blessedness contains happiness, but happiness in itself does not contain or fully encompass this idea of blessedness. That there's exhaustive definitions around this and Essentially, it is first and foremost, spiritual prosperity. That God has been so good to you that God has made a, a deposit and an investment into every single one of our lives that come with joy and come with satisfaction and fulfillment and pleasure and purpose. That we are, we're blessed. And when Jesus shows up, what was so fascinating and brilliant about his way of teaching was Jesus was constantly quoting scripture. In fact, Jesus' favorite book in the Bible, if you are curious, is the book of Deuteronomy. There's no other book in scripture that he quotes more often than the book of Deuteronomy. He also quotes Isaiah a lot, he quotes Exodus, and he quotes Psalms and Proverbs quite a bit. And in those writings, especially in Psalms and Proverbs, you get this statement, blessed, blessed. Blessed, And in many ways, Jesus shows up and he's echoing back to words that these religious people would have been familiar with. Now, if you go into the Old Testament, what you find is those blessed statements are tied to imperatives. Now, track with me on this. It's essentially saying, if you do this, you'll be blessed. Those who do these things then receive God's blessing. If you're generous, God will bless you. And if you sit at the table of the wise, God will bless you. And if you're you know, slow to speak and quick to listen, God will bless you. And if you, you know, act in terms of fighting for justice, there's, there's a blessing and a favor bestowed upon that. There's an imperative, does that make sense? You do this, God does this. And God comes to a, a group of religious people who have spent their entire um, life within a religious construct where their whole approach and mindset is earning God's goodness, earning God's love, earning God's pleasure, earning God's joy. If I do this, maybe God would do this. And then you come to the Beatitudes and Jesus elevates grace above the law. Jesus didn't come disregarding the law. He just came saying, yeah, what I and bringing to the table is even better than what the law could accomplish. Think about this, this is maybe something to just chew on for a little bit. The law articulated the expectations and the standard of God. And Jesus shows up and surpasses the law. Meaning he not only exceeds our expectations, he exceeds the expectations of God the Father. This is where Timothy Keller would say there's a significant difference uh, between uh, religious righteousness and gospel goodness. And Jesus starts out using words that would call to mind a framework that they understand life with God. And he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, blessed are those who are persecuted, right? And what, what do you immediately begin to notice? There's no imperative. In fact, the only imperative in the Beatitudes is verse 12, rejoice and be glad. That's the only imperative. And essentially, Jesus is showing up and at a very high level, here's your takeaway. Jesus shows up and says, I'm going to bless those you would not expect me to bless. Yeah, you are all very accustomed to earning and you're all very accustomed to this religious process. But I have shown up to provide goodness and to bless those you would not uh, expect. In fact, 
I'm going to bless those who are an enemy of God. I'm going to bless those who are living in rebellion to God. I'm going to bless those who live in sin and continue to crack the door on Satan's reckless agenda in the world. Yeah, th those of you who are not clapping don't realize you're in that category. <laughs> that you are the rebellious person. I am the rebellious person. I am the person eternally doomed and lost because of my fractured soul, but because of Christ and his unmerited favor upon our life, you and I are blessed. You and I are received into the family of God, not because of anything we've done, but because of everything he's done. That's why the imperative is rejoice and be glad. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And essentially, Jesus is saying, I've come to bless those who are spiritually bankrupt. And he's saying this to a bunch of religious people who are proud of their righteousness. And he said, no, no, no. I come for the spiritually broke. I've come to make an investment and I've come to cover a debt for people who could never pay it on their own. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And here's the deal, it's not a dig on you, it's not meant to be an insult, this is true of me. I'm spiritually bankrupt without the investment of Christ. I'm spiritually broke without the investment in Christ giving his life for you and I. And he says, yeah, even people who live with a depraved soul can experience my goodness. And again, he's, he's flipping the paradigm. Wait a second, we thought we had to earn this. And he's like, no, no, no. You can't earn this level of goodness. All you can do is open your heart to receiving it. And the moment you do, and the moment your righteousness is no longer anchored or built upon your personal faculties and ability to manufacture it on your own, suddenly the fruit of the Spirit becomes the byproduct of your life in a genuine, unforced, and natural way. It becomes the impulse of who you are. But again, it's embracing this upside down and inside out approach that Christ has. It's when he goes to work within our soul, he begins to produce something out through our lives that the world desperately needs. Amen. Blessed are the meek. In other words, here is what you have to understand if you go and peel back the pages, go back into chapter four. When Jesus comes out and begins his ministry, who immediately flocks to Jesus? The sick and the demon possessed. Those were the early adopters to this ministry. And why? because they had been excluded by everybody. You're ill, you have a sickness and a disease, you have a demon. Well, you're not only ostracized from society, you're also ostracized from your family and from the religious sector. You can't participate, you don't belong. And Jesus shows up and he begins his ministry and all these people who've been ostracized their whole life, shamed and rejected, Look at Jesus and they think, is there any chance we could fit with this guy? Is there any chance that this could be the coming king and we could be a part of his kingdom? These were people who, when they looked in the mirror, they didn't see anything significant. These were people who probably battled insecurity and self-deprecation every single day of their life. And he turns around and says, yeah, to those who are meek, those who don't see significance in the mirror, my goodness upon your life, my favor extended to you, and may your soul prosper. It's a beautiful thing. Blessed are those who mourn. Jesus shows up and he's like, yeah, we live in times, and this is certainly true in our context, where some have it so good materially that they're able to masquerade the doing well spiritually. You know, some of us are, life is, is so good, we can put up a facade that tells a different narrative that contradicts the reality of our soul. And he, he's coming and he's saying, blessed are those who mourn, like they know true loss and grief and they can't hide it. You can look at them and be like, man, look at their circumstances. The tragedy of life has struck that home. And what Jesus is saying in this parable or in these Beatitudes is he's saying people who 
just understand this reality, are the ones who are closest to God's work in their life. This is why when I talk to pastors, I say often prosperity is a much bigger issue for the church in America than persecution. Because we have it so well, we live in the most successful, powerful, and wealthiest nation in the entire world in human history. We have a lot that we bank a false security on. And it's just, Jesus is saying, yeah, I've come to people who realize nothing in this world can sustain you and who mourn that reality. In high school, I remember a time they used to bring in all of these speakers to stare, uh, scare us straight. And so they'd have assemblies or they'd have people come into our classrooms and they would talk about crime and violence and don't do drugs. In fact, here's a picture of your brain on drugs and don't drink and drive, all those things. Anyone, can you relate to those, the dare groups coming in? There's one time this cop came in with a group and he had what was called beer goggles. Not, not the cute things that you and your frat buddies wear, but like these goggles that were meant to distort your vision and to disorient your perception. And so what he would do is he'd put on these goggles and he would lead you through a field sobriety test to which we all failed miserably. And then he would say, exactly, you can't even walk a straight line. Can you imagine driving 60 miles per hour like this? Don't drink and drive. And I say all that because... Again, we're so blessed to live at this time of history within this wonderful nation. But in many ways, the American dream can distort our view and perception of what Jesus is declaring in the gospel. And so we can, we can get it wrong. Because we're intoxicated by what the world can offer, we miss what Jesus is extending to us. And, he, and he's going down the list. And again, the overarching theme is I have come to bless those you would not expect. I have come to extend goodness and favor to those who can never earn it. I mean, think about that statement. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. You ever been hungry and thirsty? You ever been hangry? It's like, if I don't eat something, I'm gonna fight someone. Yeah, when you're hungry and thirsty, what's the reality? You have a craving that you can't meet. If there was food in front of you, you'd already be eating it. If there's something to drink, you'd already quench your thirst. You are hungry and you're thirsty, and in the moment, you're unable to meet the desire. You tracking with me? Jesus is saying, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now, now think of scripture's definitions of righteousness. Things like integrity, patience, humility, generosity, grace, forgiveness, gentleness, those are all relational dynamics. He, and essentially what he's saying is, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for relational rightness. Blessed are those who's like, oh, there's just so many fractures in my family, so many broken relationships within our world. So much breaking, broken relationships within our society and we hunger and we thirst for relational rightness, yet we can't quench our thirst. We can't satisfy the need. And Jesus says, I've come to extend goodness and to work even in those situations. I mean, it's flipping upside down. Wait a second. We've been so religiously conditioned to earn and produce Doing, doing, doing. But folks, you and I are not human doings. We're human beings. And it's learning to be at rest in the goodness of God, knowing you don't have to force it, you don't have to do anything, but receive his unmerited favor upon your life. And Jesus is saying, yeah, I have come to do something uncomfortable for you. And now I'm asking you as my kids and as my followers and as citizens of my kingdom in the same way I was willing to do something uncomfortable for you, would you do something uncomfortable for me? And would you embrace these virtues and these values? And, you know, like I said last week, I, 
am unwavering in this opinion. I believe our nation has been profoundly shaped, molded, guided, and formed uh, by Judeo-Christian values. I believe if you extract biblical principles and God's word and its influence within our nation, our country would be unrecognizable. I believe that. And so with that, from the founding of our country to now, there are a lot of cultural colloquialisms. I can never say that right, but it's a tough one. <laughs> statements that we make. A lot of times we make these statements, but we don't know really what it means and really where it came from. So statements like, turn the other cheek, or go the extra mile, or give the shirt off your back. We've all heard these things, but where did they come from? God's word. And who said them? Jesus. And when did he say them? Matthew chapter five. He establishes the Beatitudes. He flips upside down the paradigms. And then he says this. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles and give to the, to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. The shirt off your back, turning the other cheek, going the extra mile. And, and how does he start the statement? You've heard it said, an eye for an eye. You have been programmed for retaliation, primed for retaliation. Your instincts, your impulse are to get right, make things even, and to retaliate, eye for an eye. And every single one of us carry frustrations, annoyances, grievances, offenses, that we're all frustrated about, we're all harboring this stuff, and we wanna make it right, and how? At the expense of the person who caused it. It's in our nature. I mean, think about your kids. Your kid could lie before they could talk, and they could steal before they could walk. You ever notice that? It's like, no one had to teach us to be bad. That kid knows how to lie before someone even informed them of what a lie was. Something in our nature is bent towards retaliation. And Jesus says, yeah, but I came bent for reconciliation. You've heard it said an eye for an eye. But I say, give the coat off your back. Go the extra mile. Turn the other cheek. Now, I need everyone's participation. But show of hands in the room, across all of our campuses, if you are right-handed. Come on, raise your hand at me if you're right-handed. Yeah, it's like 98% of the room is right-handed. In Jesus' day, this is not biblical. It was just the assumption of the culture that the left hand was the hand of the devil. People actually looked down upon the left hand in that time of living. Take a deep breath. That's not biblical. It was just an assumption. <laughs> but here's the thing. As a right-handed person, if you were to come up to me and smack me across the face, which I get the feeling every single week about 2% would like to. <laughs> if you smack me across the face with your right hand, what cheek are you gonna hit? My left cheek. Think about this. Jesus says, whoever smacks you on the right cheek, turn the other cheek. Jesus is talking to a culture that is predominantly right-handed. And what he's not saying is just let people physically abuse you. That's not what he's saying. But in order for a right-handed person to smack someone on the right cheek, what do they have to do? Backhand them. He's talking about the insults that come our way. He's talking about the offenses. And here's the deal. If you're gonna follow Christ, you're gonna be insulted. It's just the way it is. Only dead fish swim with the current. You're gonna have to go against the grain. You're gonna have to swim upstream, but there's purpose and fulfillment and it glorifies God. But you're gonna be insulted. At a minimum, they're gonna laugh at you. They might start to critique you. Some will even shame or hate you. It's just part of the deal. Take it like a champ. 
And, and I know no one ever wants to say amen like that, right? Maybe you already heard this message. You're like, I'm prepared. But here's the thing. I think we've become so cute, so domesticated in our faith. In fact, I think, this is my own personal theory, whatever. I think this is why the church at large in America is having such a hard time attracting men. Be because we have reduced this life of faith to practicing religion that calls for no boldness, no strength, no courage, no just zeal for God. Nothing about our God is weak. Nothing about a man hanging naked, being publicly executed and still praying for his enemies is weak. It's strong, it's valiant, it's just courageous, it's inspiring. And Jesus is saying, okay, if we're gonna do this, you can't keep getting your feelings hurt. You can't keep getting offended. And every time you take an offense, you build a fence. You build a barrier between you and the world God is trying to release his redemptive plan unto. And, and, and Jesus said, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the same way, I showed up blessing those you would not expect me to bless. And in the same way, I showed up extending goodness to those living in rebellion. I'm asking you to do the same. What was so brilliant about Jesus, he had a sharp mind and thick skin and it helped him maintain a soft heart. And if we're gonna follow Christ, we need to develop a sharp mind and thick skin also that we can maintain a soft heart, also that we can love the next person well. Jesus hangs on the cross and what does he pray? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Folks, a mark of spiritual maturity is learning to empathize with people's ignorance. Ah, oh, they just don't know. <sighs> but my Christ did something uncomfortable for me. And as a result, I'm blessed. So I'm gonna do something uncomfortable for them in hopes that they too will experience his goodness. Turn the other cheek. Go the, go the second mile. Well, what does that mean? In the Roman time in which Jesus was living, there was a law in place. If a Roman soldier ever walked up to anyone in the community and said, carry my equipment, carry my tools, carry my armor, you had to drop what you were doing and carry it for a mile. If they needed you to go a mile, you had to go the full mile. And Jesus says, yeah, the next time someone comes up to you and sticks it to you, carry my stuff. Jesus says, go two miles. Exceed the expectation. Exceed the standard. Essentially what Jesus is saying is my people are going to raise the bar. My people are going to be standard bearers in a world that desperately needs a better example. Go the extra mile. It requires strength. It requires resolve. It requires a long obedience in the same direction. I follow Jesus. It's wonderful. Jesus knew, hey, if you walk two miles with someone, either two things are gonna happen. One, they're gonna know not to ask you the second time. Or two, you're gonna get to spend some time with it. By its end, you're gonna become their friend. And I just wonder, what would happen if we became standard bearers within our world? where people started realizing, my goodness, they're just the type of people who go above and beyond. They operate at a different standard. People start to think, man, the world needs more Christians. In fact, not only does the world need more Christians, maybe, maybe I need to become a Christian because they're living in such a way that is inspiring. This is why I think we need to extend to the next generation you have all these kids jumping on all these bizarre causes because they so desperately want to be a part of something. It's like the greatest legacy that ever touched down on human earth stands in front of all of us, but we're playing it safe and the next generation is bored when they look at our faith. We're like an animal at a zoo born into captivity that doesn't know how to survive in the wild. And Jesus is saying, no, I came to rush the gates of hell. I came to invade the world, not avoid the world. 
Go the extra mile and give the shirt off your back. Be irrationally generous in a way that causes people to think, what is that? Jesus is saying, if you're going to be my kids and a part of my kingdom, well, you can't be easily insulted. You can't be easily intimidated. And you can't be overly greedy. I'm asking you, Christ would say, to do something uncomfortable for others in the same way I've done something uncomfortable for you. Because we don't take our cues from Caesar and we don't take our cues from culture. We take them from Christ and we're part of his kingdom. Can I get an amen?